If you'd like to meet some ex-Muslims, just visit your local mosque, because it's full of them. Years ago, back in 2005, 2006, 2007, when a few of us started blasting away at Muhammad and the Quran, there weren't a lot of ex-Muslims around. In fact, there were so few ex-Muslims that it was common to hear Muslims claiming that no one ever leaves Islam, and that the handful of people who claimed to be ex-Muslims were lying. But we kept blasting away at the Dawaganda, we kept exposing the lies, Fast forward a decade or so, and Muslim scholars and apologists were panicking about all the Muslims, especially young Muslims, who were leaving Islam. 24% of Muslim youth are leaving Islam. Polls conducted in the Muslim world reveal that up to 5% of Muslims in some of the most conservative Muslim countries in the world are closet atheists. Research has shown that over 100,000 Muslims leave Islam every single year. Our youth are full of doubts and nobody's answering their questions. We're talking about, you know what I'm trying to say, how to, uh, it's, it's not a leather sock, yes, a leather sock, who cares if it's a leather sock or not, man? Your, your child is going to become an apostate. And you're talking about if it's a leather sock. Wow. And if we don't take constructive steps to deal with this, it is going to become an avalanche, a tsunami. I can't go on YouTube or Twitter without running into ex-Muslims. Every time I open my laptop, I see messages like this. Thank you, David, for opening my eyes. New ex-Muslim here. I'm 16, and I'm two or three months not Muslim. I became a Christian and almost lost faith, but David helped me a lot. God bless, brother. Former Muslim here. Your videos have helped to reconfirm and sealed my faith in Jesus. You helped me a lot to leave this disgusting religion. Thank you, Brother Daoud. God bless you and your family. I left Islam. Thank you, David Wood. I hope you and AP will end Islam. I'm 15 and I'm four months not Muslim anymore. Thank you, David, for opening my eyes. Thank you, David, for your ministry of disposing false prophet and deception of Islam. I was Muslim when I found your videos on YouTube. By the will of Almighty God, by the grace of God and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I became a Christian. I feel this blessedness and tranquility within me. I thank God that I know English a little, that I could understand your speeches. You, apostate prophet, Christian Prince, William Lane Craig, our brothers and sisters from Speaker's Corner, Bob, J. Smith, Hatoon, you all had helped me to see true evangelism and showed me love of God and his willingness to save our souls. God bless you, David. Keep it up. I wish you and your family, your kids, happiness and good health. In Jesus' name, with love and deep respect, from Kazakhstan. Apostasy is spreading faster than COVID. But with the rise of apostasy comes a new terror for Muslim scholars and apologists. Ex-Muslims in the mosque. So one of the more shocking things that I have experienced over the course of those years is are the number of young boys and girls aged between 13 to 18 who have openly declared their apostasy to me. And I'm talking within the hundreds. So, Asadullah Ali, just one Muslim speaker, has heard from hundreds of ex-Muslims. But he's referring to a special kind of ex-Muslim. However, at the same time, they have also declared to me that they are Hutad, they are prophets of the Quran. They are leading prayer to the masjid. They are engaged in madrasa, education. Okay? And they are still leading that life, while simultaneously declaring their apostasy. These are ex-Muslims who are still living as Muslims. They seem like devout Muslims at their mosques and their Islamic schools, and yet they're apostates. And if hundreds of these ex-Muslims in the mosque have secretly confessed their apostasy to Asadullah Ali, how many are there who've met him but haven't confided in him? How many are there who haven't met him 
and haven't told anyone that they don't believe in Islam. Interestingly, I hear from these ex-Muslims in the mosque too. I don't normally draw attention to their comments, but let's read two of them. I'm an undercover ex-Muslim. This video, he's referring to a video I posted about some of the silly misrepresentations of Christianity that are popular among Muslims. This video just shows you a small taste of the wonderful mentality I have to deal with every single day of my life. He's an undercover ex-Muslim. He's an apostate who still lives as a Muslim. Okay, dear David, here I go. As a Muslim, or at least I pretend to be Muslim in front of people for obvious reasons, I know all the facts you listed except the finger-licking horror. So he's commenting on one of my videos about how disgusting Muhammad was. I mean, we were taught in primary school that the prophet used to lick his finger after eating, and I thought it was understandable if the food is too good and you're alone at home, there's nothing alarming about it. However, they didn't tell us about the part of having his fingers licked by other people. Yep, that is disgusting. What a creepy prophet. I guess they didn't want us to be traumatized. And to answer your question how, as a Muslim, I used to consile with these horrors, well, simple, we go on with our life without thinking about it, we ignore it, because as children, we're taught that thinking is bad when it comes to criticizing Islam. We're shushed, yelled at, and even punished sometimes. Let's hope for a better future with the new generation. Keep up the good work. There are millions of ex-Muslims living as Muslims, both in Muslim countries and in non-Muslim countries. In some places, they don't want to announce their apostasy because they would face violence. In other places, they don't want to announce their apostasy because they don't want to be vilified by their community, or maybe they just don't want to disappoint their families. But think about the quandary Muslim leaders are in right now. They know that there are millions of ex-Muslims living as Muslims, reciting the Quran, attending Islamic schools. But what can Muslim leaders do about this? It seems like a problem they'd want to address. It seems like something they'd want to get out in the open. This thing's just getting started. It's going to get much, much worse very, very quickly. You'd expect Muslim leaders to take some radical steps to stand up in mosques and madrasas and say, look, we understand that some of you, especially you young people, may not really believe in Muhammad. We want you to know that it's safe to come forward and to tell us what you really think. We'll try to convince you that Islam is true. But if we can't, then you shouldn't continue to live as Muslims. It seems like they'd have to do something like that if they're going to deal with the problem. But they can't do that because as soon as they tell people it's okay to announce their apostasy, they're suddenly going to be confronted with millions of ex-Muslims. And the young generation would look around and say, wait a minute, how come so many people who've been reciting the Quran their entire lives don't believe in it? apostasy would suddenly become normal. And once that happens, once the intimidation and manipulation can no longer keep ex-Muslims quiet, Islam collapses. So they can't deal with the problem, but at the same time, they can't ignore the problem either because the avalanche has already started. Islam is going to collapse either way. I can just imagine a scene in a mosque a few years from now. The imam turns to the Muslims who are gathered together, and he says, Guys, I've been the imam here for years, but I can't live this lie anymore. I don't really believe in Islam. There's a gasp from the congregation. But then a hand goes up, and someone says, you know, I don't believe this either. Then another hand goes up. Then another. And pretty soon, they realize that they're all apostates. It just backfired on you. It just backfired on you. This 
Just because that power of religion, there's a reason to it. Yeah? Yeah?